just a simple little, I mean, this could honestly be a snow globe, a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling. And even our best and brightest didn't figure it out until almost 1960. Even, even the top guys, they were out there. And that would be the United States and the Soviet Union back then. And when they figured this out in 1960, they said, yeah, you know what? Our civilization's already been built and it would be too disruptive. So let's just not tell anybody until we can figure out how to release it to the public. And forward to 2015, when HD technology got very, very good and they started you know, letting it allowed to be come out. And uh, so our groups, the groups that I'm part of have been helping to release this information and eventually it's gonna hit critical mass and everybody's gonna know about it. So there you go, that's the short version. All right, there we go, pretty concise. All right, so I'm gonna open the, uh, the floor here to, to questions from the class. So we'll just uh, sure. go, go first. Oh, I know you were about to ask the question. Oh, no, no, I'm, no, I'm, this is all for y'all. All right, so I'm gonna just go ahead and ask you a pretty big question. All right, so. Yeah. Have you ever had thoughts or doubt, doubts about the flat earth theory while you were a part of it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I did the, in fact, the, the first six months that I was doing this because nobody gets into this thinking it's a great idea. In fact, everybody hates it. Every, including me. I was one of the most stubborn guys uh, getting involved. I, I sat on this thing for nine months from literally the summer of 2014 until 2015 before I even made my first video on it. And after I made my first video, I absolutely thought that somebody in academia would call me up or email me or something and say, okay, here's where you went wrong. And they didn't. So I was, I was kind of just holding my breath, just waiting for somebody to get a hold of me. And uh, the opposite happened where people from all, all different walks of life professionally were contacting me, like all branches of the armed forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, air traffic controllers, pilots, stuff that, by the way, they didn't talk about in the documentary because they didn't want to. They hated Flat Earth. I, in fact, I should, let me put that out there. <laughs> the documentary that you watched was not produced by me in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the director and producers and everybody from Hollywood uh, absolutely hated flat earth especially by the time they got to the end because of this right here you know you guys asking questions they didn't want uh, any kids getting involved at all so yeah for at least the first six months of 2015 i was just waiting for that call and i can i got more people from the professional side that were saying yeah it's not that crazy and here's why so that by the time i think i got to maybe the fall I didn't have any doubts anymore. It was like, really? I mean, even I, yeah, had doubts. But I, after that time had elapsed, it's like, well, if nobody debunked me by now, then no one's going to. Uh, and here we are five years later after that first video. And uh, it's, just, it's freaking huge. <laughs> I was just on CBS uh, uh, Sunday. And who, who would have thought? We were on the cover of, in 2019, we were on the cover of Popular Science, um, Newsweek and Skeptic Magazine, all, all in 2019. And, you know, that's 2020, it's already getting weirder. So, anyway, sorry, what else you got? Okay, so I have a, uh, I have a question about, um, like, before you started, like, the Flat Earth, like, whenever, like, that was, like, your main focus, what were some other conspiracies that, like, Oh, I was into everything. Uh, and again, the, the, the documentary could only do so much because even though they, they spent seven months with us, you know, going around with us, uh, they had to boil it down to 100 minutes. So, like, they didn't, and they did not want to touch on any other conspiracies. Um, my favorites, I mean, obviously, I mean, I have an opinion. If you even, I will talk, a couple things. I will talk about any conspiracy that you would want to want to bring up. Although most of the time I say whatever it is, it's going to be below flat Earth because it's, nothing's bigger than flat Earth except maybe the existence of God or something like that. Um, but in fact, I'm not even now not even sure if I'm allowed to talk about the other stuff in schools. But you know, the one the obvious ones, uh, the the moon missions, 9/11, uh, Pearl Harbor, every American war. Um, Stuff like that. My favorite, though, JFK. That's always a good one. 
Um, and so like, I have an opinion on those. There's all sorts of ones that I like. There's others I don't like. Do I think that Elvis Presley had Bigfoot's baby? No, probably not. But at the same time, you know, uh, like I even came up with my own, which I, I love so much. Um, it's the one I have an exclusive on it, the Panama Canal, for example, a perfect example. And you say, well, Panama Canal, it's not a conspiracy. I go, yeah, it is. Uh, just by definition, it is uh, like the Hoover Dam. And I know you guys are really young. So some of these things you may or may not know about the Hoover Dam, really, really big dam. When they built it, it uh, they lost, I think, 70 people in the making of it. You know, people fall. The accidents happen on construction sites. Uh, but most people don't know that the building of the Panama Canal, which was just a big ditch in the, in the jungle, um, we lost 6,000 men, the better part of it. And it's like, wow, that's a lot of people. I go, yeah, they died of malaria and yellow fever. And you go, oh, okay, well, malaria kills people. It's like, yeah, but they knew they were going to lose that many men because the United States didn't start the Panama Canal. Uh, the French did. The French came in, they started, and they lost 21,000 men. So much so were they just, the, the people were protesting and said, that's right, we quit, we're done. The mosquitoes beat us, and they went home, put down their shovels and went home, and the Americans were like, oh, let's get on this. But the Americans had to invent mosquito netting and insect repellent and better stuff, and they still expected to uh, lose up to 10,000 men. So the question is, okay, what's the conspiracy? The conspiracy is when you tell, when people volunteer to get paid to go down to the jungle, dig this big ditch, do you tell them there's a one in eight chance you're going to die? No, you don't, because that's not how business works. You don't tell them the risks and they're not going to find out about it. So, you know, until they get down there and things move really slowly a hundred years ago. So there you go. Classic definition of a conspiracy. How's that? I was actually... That was interesting. Yeah, I've never never heard anything about that before. Yeah, nobody nobody has. I mean, I, it's it's one of the look conspiracies. Let me let me go follow up on the on, on this gentleman's question real quick. There are conspiracies in just about every aspect of your life. Um, it's just that it's a lot we don't look at because we're not comfortable. It's outside of our comfort zone. I mean, look, we all know a, a conspiracy is just when three or more people conspire to hide something that may or may not be illegal and or unethical. So does it happen in politics? Yeah, <laughs> business all the time. Sports, you bet. Um, entertainment, yeah, uh, we've heard of a few. Uh, even journalism and science, it does happen. Uh, in science, I'm not saying that, that, um, that science is an evil, horrible place, but scientists do cut corners for the money. It happens all the time, you know, especially when, when scientists get hired for the private sector. You know, they, they cut corners for things I don't know, like lead paint, lead gasoline, DDT, all the variations of DDT, asbestos, cigarettes, <laughs> and so on. So, look, there's conspiracies out there, and everyone knows that. Look, there are lies. So the question is, it's what's, what you're willing to look at and what you're not. And if you're in the conspiracy world, you're willing to look at a lot more. Uh, it, it's a very, very slippery slope. There you go. That's the end of my little rant. Excellent. All right, next question. Um, uh, where do you find the information about these conspiracies? Good question. You got to do a lot, a lot of your own research. Um, some, some of it's public information. Some of it's government PDF files that are out there just lying around. None of it's secret. You know, nobody, with the exception of well, a couple of guys out there from Wiki, <laughs> WikiLeaks release like secret in, you know, information. I never encourage people to like join the military and then release confidential files later. There's a reason why they're confidential files. Um, a lot of it though is, is just websites and documents like lying around, uh, especially like with the flat earth, the, uh, you know, most of the stuff we found was, was just right out there in, in front. Like the Antarctic treaty, for example, is just a PDF that anyone can get uh, because it's not, it's not classified. I mean, some of it you have to dig. You, you got to find it for yourself. Other, uh, don't take anything at face value. So yeah, there's lots of YouTube videos out there that, that try to summarize things for different conspiracies. If you're interested in them, you look at it and say, okay, and you, you know, do, do your own digging and see, figure it out for yourself why you like this conspiracy or you don't like this conspiracy. Um, if it sounds too wild to be true, don't necessarily assume it is. Uh, you know, flat earth is, is ridiculous sounding at first. Absolutely. Everybody, everybody reacts the same way to flat earth. It's like, oh, this is stupid. Nobody should ever, ever believe in that. It's like, yeah, 
But remember that, you know, putting a man on the moon was also considered ridiculous. And then supposedly when it happened, everyone accepted it. And then almost immediately afterwards, people like going, hey, wait a minute, there's a couple of things that don't make sense. And that was chipped away and chipped away until the internet came out, then everything kind of exploded. So yeah, as far as, as far as just looking into general conspiracies, just, just, just keep digging. Don't just stop at one thing. Don't stop at a couple of YouTube videos. Poke around on the ones you like. And the ones you don't like, I mean, you'll know. If you're like, yeah, that one seems silly. Or, or you just have no interest in it, then fine. Fine, don't look at it. And I would say as a teacher, that's great advice. That, that is wonderful advice for anything you're looking up, whether it's conspiracy theories or, or stuff for school or anything. That's, that's great advice. But I, it's something I say at the end of every, almost every video I made in the beginning, uh, which was, again, don't take my word for it. Like what I'm talking to you now about, you know, I'm not here to necessarily convince you or even persuade you. I'm just here to give you a couple of ideas. Uh, do your own research. And that's, that's one of the reasons, by the way, why uh, our group has such a high retention rate is that I don't convince you in the flat earth. You end up convincing yourself. You're the one that goes and, and takes looks at the globe and chips away at it yourself. And if you're the one that breaks it down, how can you rebuild it? So yeah, there's people that, that go into the, the community and you know, make videos and then kind of fall away and, and don't make videos for a while. They lose their enthusiasm for whatever reason. You know, life happens. But nobody goes back. They, they can't. There's nothing to go back to because you were the one that tore it down in the first place. Next. Um, do you worship the idea of the flat earth? Do I worship the idea? Yes. Like, does your, <clears throat> your whole entire life revolves around that? Would oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It does like now. Say, say, that, say that last part one more time. Would you say that that's why you live is to spread the flat earth theory? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's funny. I, I used to joke about this uh, a couple of years ago, which was if I end up, if I live long enough to uh, write an autobiography, it'd probably be called unsolicited. Meaning, and I wasn't kidding. In in the movie, there was a quote they used. It's like you know, I didn't find the flat Earth. The flat Earth found me. I got a lot of positive reinforcement from flat Earth without even having to do anything. That was the weird part, meaning I, I didn't want to get into flat earth. I didn't even want to run point on this. I wanted, you know, the guy in the, the documentary, the guy that yelled a lot, Matt Boylan, the, the artist who like yelled and screamed at the camera. I absolutely wanted him to, to take point because he you know, seemed like a, a more dynamic personality and, and producers really, really liked him. And then just people, more and more people started calling me. Uh, a publisher out of London said, hey, can we turn your clues into a book? And they didn't talk about it in the, in the movie. Yeah, it's like, yeah, sure why not um a company in australia said hey can you, would you like to fly down and do a commercial for our cell phone or for our mobile app and it's like yeah sure why not and so i just said yes to, to anything that anyone ever threw at me and you know conferences and meetups and all this other fun stuff and interviews and and so it it came naturally i didn't have to do anything which, you know, I didn't have to go out. I, you know, I still don't have an agent. Uh, you know, I, I don't have to solicit anything, which is why it was called unsolicited. I, they just kept coming at me. It's like, okay, well, if you believe in destiny, if you believe in fate or whatever you call it, it just seemed to work out that way. It's like, all right, why would I fight it? I, I basically just gave up fighting whatever, you know, this was going to, was going to happen to me. So yeah. Yeah, it's what I do all the time. I mean, after you guys, uh, later I've got the University of Tennessee, and then after that, I've got a podcast out on in somewhere out in New York, and then who knows? Now, and on top of that, there like there's been multiple conferences that have been canceled this year for you know the whole virus thing. But uh, other because everything can be done remotely, just people just keep calling, calling, calling. So I'm just gonna say yes until it stops. All right, next question. All right, so um. What would you say is the area of your theory that gets the most criticism? Oh, oh, so what's the worst part of flat earth? And what's the part that just gets hammered as much as possible? Okay, well, there's, there's two things there. What the, our, best, our best evidence is also our most criticized because it's the one we put out in front the most. 
But I'll tell you the one that I'm really surprised more people don't look at because it's obviously the weakest point. But I'll tell you why it's also the weakest point. So the most, uh, the biggest piece of evidence that we throw out there, which is criticized on, on a regular basis, is long distance photography. And which, again, not talked about in the documentary. I know they covered a couple of laser tests, but, you know, you remember the director hated us. So they, they, they eliminated anything that even leaned in our direction. They hated uh, mostly because of, uh, if you remember, that 12-year-old kid that walked up to me during the conference. He, uh, they, that's when they, everything changed. And you can listen to that. Uh, I think it's on the iTunes version, the, the director's commentary. So long as photography is our best and our worst because, because it's out there in the front. So we say the perfect example would be if the curvature of the earth, mainstream science says the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared, which is every eight inches per mile per mile, which means uh, like at three miles is three times three, which is nine times eight is 72. And then 10 miles, it's 800 inches. And if you're 50 miles, it's like 1700 feet. So we keep shooting, everyone keeps going out to the beach and shooting long distance photography with their cameras. HD cameras have changed everything. And so people criticize that on a regular basis because atmospheric conditions change on a, on a, on a regular basis. What you're breathing in that classroom right now is, you know, a thin version of water. Basically, it's only 99% transparent. It's mostly nitrogen. You're breathing in oh, less than 20% oxygen. Uh, and over distances, it gets thicker, and that changes with temperature and elevation and wind conditions and all this other stuff. You're basically, it's just this big soup. And so some days it looks really, really great, and other days it doesn't. So it's, that's the most criticized, because again, it's the one we use more often than anything. People just go down to any beach, whatever it is, lake, ocean, bay, whatever, and shoot long distance photography. They shoot a lighthouse or an oil rig or boats or a landmass on the other side. And it's constantly criticized. Is it our weakest point? No, it's our strongest point, but it, it's criticized the most. Our weakest point would be, without a doubt, uh, the Antarctic sun. So, because if the sun is this tiny little ball, less than 50 miles wide, this tiny little light bulb that's spinning above us like a mobile above a child's crib, then the, the Arctic 24 hour sun, that's easy. That, that can be done, you know, if you're doing that above a big dinner plate. But the Antarctic sun can't happen naturally. There's gotta be something else. There's some other light source. There's some sort of optics thing that we, we don't know about. But it doesn't, but it's fine. It doesn't, doesn't really hurt us because of the Antarctic Treaty. Because the Antarctic Treaty was put in place in 1959. So civilians get very, very, very limited access to the Antarctic. And plus, it's a horrible, horrible place to go. So nobody goes there anyway. So there you go. Our, our strongest and our weakest in one package. Well, um, what I'm kind of confused by you, like the Earth is so like, us who believe in like the round earth and the globe like you would have to be like you would feel like hundreds of miles away to be able to like see the actual curvature of the earth because of how big the actual earth is so like what is is there a camera like in in this society that's able to like reach actually hundreds of thousands of miles to see like the actual curvature because i don't it, it would be so hard to be able to see it like one no 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 i got you i got you well there's there's a couple things there and uh, uh all right so first off uh, for everyone that says and, and i'm glad you brought that up because you're right neil neil tyson you know the most popular scientist in the world um he's been really good about saying that no civilian people like you and me no one will ever be able to see at least the side to side curve ever because you won't be able to get up high enough because the world's too big. He's, he said that. Now, the reason why I point that out is there was a jump that was done by Red Bull a couple of years ago by a guy named Felix Bumgarner. He went up to 130,000 feet and he said that he saw the curvature and they used a wide angle lens and they showed this severe curvature. And Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson came out on, on stage and, and said that it was dishonest. He goes that you cannot see. He goes, Felix didn't see the curvature. Nobody can see the curvature unless you're an astronaut which I thought was interesting. But so from side to side, there's nothing you can do. You know, he says there's, you can't see a curvature. And we actually agree with him. It's like, yeah, we, flat world or, or his big globe. But when you're looking off into the distance, you know, forward ahead, you know, because it's like, okay, ships go over the horizon, right? They disappear off into the horizon. 
And 10 years ago, I would have been, oh, yeah, yeah, they do disappear off in the horizon. There must be a curve. However, now with HD technology, those ships aren't gone anymore. That's what's changed. That's the big thing, which is objects that were gone. You know, the ship goes, oh, you know, way off into the distance, which means it goes over the hill. It goes over the curve, behind the curve. They should be gone forever. You can't see on the other side of a hill. You can now, which means there is no hill. Meaning if you can look up, if you can see a boat at 30 miles, and we've talked to Navy guys that can shoot infrared at 50 miles and 60 miles, that boat it should be way on the other side of the curve. And yet HD technology, now we can see this. In fact, um, there's a wonderful, there's some great video, recent videos they put on my channel that weren't done by me or done by other people. They were shooting um, something we had missed, which was they were shooting oil rigs off of California, off of Santa Barbara. Oil rig one was at, uh, let's say, six miles. And another one was pushing at nine or 10 behind it. You can see the oil rigs perfectly clear. And, and the camera was only, I think, I mean, some people shot from, multiple people did this. Some people shot at one foot off the water. Some people shot at eight foot off the water. Didn't really matter. The point was, is that when you looked at these oil rigs, the horizon was behind them. And that can't be on a globe Earth. Cannot be. Uh, the, because remember, if it'd be like taking a piece of paper and putting two dots on it and bending the paper to where the dots are on the other side. Well, where's the horizon? The horizon is always in front of those dots. And yet that's not what we see. We always see the horizon behind the objects. And so if anyone shows a video and says, oh, look, this boat was cut in half by the horizon. It's like, oh, no, no, you can't see that anymore. Because when we show them the horizon behind objects, they say, well, that's a mirage. And we say, no, it, it's not. And so, you know, anytime you see a boat with, that's cut in half, that's just atmospheric lensing. With, because you remember, you're looking through soup. If you have any doubts, take a, if you've anyone got a glass of water, you put a straw in it and look at it from the side, the straw gets bent. That kind of answer it, kind of? There's no, there's no camera, sorry, by the way, to, let me, the short version of this is there's no camera that can see really, 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 really far because there's just too much thickness of the atmosphere. It's the air that you're breathing in there is like, again, like water. It's kind of like, have you ever seen movies of whales underwater? You can only see them so far. In fact, I'll take it one step further. If anyone has any seen, seen scuba divers, when a scuba diver gets down to, I don't know, 150, pushing 200 feet, the sun is gone. Bright summer day, why is the sun gone? Well, because the sun cannot penetrate that much water. What you're breathing in now is just a thin version of that. It'll, you can only look so far. I think the max distance at sea level is maybe 150 miles, if you're lucky, on the perfect conditions. And on mountaintops, it gets thinner. And when you get up in airplanes, oh, yeah, you can see much, much further because it's way, way thinner up there. There you go. Sorry, I ramble. Okay. Um, I have a question. How yeah. do you feel about the um, conspiracy about the Federal Reserve? So about the what? Federal Reserve. Oh, Federal Reserve. Um, it's not really a conspiracy. It's really out in front of everybody. Um, the, if anyone doesn't know the, the Federal Reserve we're talking about here is um, that the money that is printed, the money that's in your wallet, is printed by a private company. It's not actually printed by the government. It's just a group with the name of Federal Reserve. I mean, they just called themselves the Federal Reserve. It sounds very government official, but it's actually a private entity that uh, loans money. It prints out money to the government. <laughs> it's a weird, weird thing. And I, I mean, I, I, it's going to be, I can't explain it all in, in this, but it, it's, it's, governments don't like it because once you get involved with the Federal Reserve, you're always, they're, they're printing money at a, at a rate that you'll never be able to pay them back. So the Federal Reserve just gets bigger and more powerful. It's basically a giant bank that can take over a country and take over its money supply. And, and the government itself is beholden to them. Now, does it increase the economy? Yeah, it can. I mean, the Federal Reserve is, is very responsible for a lot of things that happen in the economy. Uh, is it an evil entity? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, there's lots of presidents over the years that have fought it, but it seems that the Federal Reserve, I mean, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere at this point. I mean, I mean you'd have to have a ma massive revolution to get rid of it. But yeah, it's an interesting one, Federal Reserve. I mean, is it, is it the most sinister conspiracy out there? No. 
Uh, it's, it's the one that's most tied directly to our lives on a daily basis. Cause again, you know, the notes that you're holding in your hand are tied directly to it. Uh, but is it the most evil? Nah, nah, not, not, doesn't even break my top 10. What's the most evil one? The most evil conspiracy? Besides the flat earth. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. In fact, flat earth isn't even, is an evil conspiracy because it wasn't even because the men, it wasn't designed by man. You know, we, we didn't invent this, you know, whoever was the older civilizations or God or whatever you want to call it, that, that was built by them. So is it the most evil? We, we didn't even figure it out until 1960. Um, no, nah, the, most, the most evil conspiracies there are generally the ones that are tied to war because war is very profitable, very profitable. I mean, that's, everybody knows it, but no one wants to talk about it. And so, you know, America, we, you know, now that we've gotten to the state that where we are, we, we go and we pick on other things. And if there's resources out there, we're going to get them. If you have resources on your land, we're eventually going to either bargain with you or take them from you. Um, money, let's, let's put it this way. Let's, let's go out. Forget about the Federal Reserve. The greatest evil in the world, I hate to say this because, again, it's part of our lives, is physical money because it allows bad people to do bad things uh, power corrupts that's that's the short version and it's a pass to any women in that in, in your room uh women aren't as nearly as corruptible as men. men men are the ones that seem to get themselves in the most trouble because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and it's an old old saying but it's very very true so yeah from there comes war and most of the wars that we have done, I mean, some, some of them are, are kind of done what they call the greater good, but it's usually just an empire building on its own. I mean, every American war that has ever been fought has been done for an ulterior motive, but we've written in the, nobody wants to be the bad guys. So we, we say that there were the white hats, but more often we're the black hats. But if you're the black hats, you don't want to, you know, nobody wants to be the black hats. Nobody wants to be the villain. But sometimes for the greater good, that's what happens. What else? I, um, <clears throat> so, like, why, why did you start following the flat earth theory or so? And, like, what is your go-to way to convince other people about the flat earth? Uh, I, why did I follow it? I didn't, I didn't want to follow it. I was bored. Literally, I was conspiracy bored. I looked at just about every conspiracy you could think of, and I'm older. So I came up with the idea. It's like, yeah, you know what? I've never looked into flat earth, and that's stupid. Might as well take a shot at that, put it on my bucket list, and, and shut it down in a weekend. And that's how I got into it. Uh, it, it was simple as that. I mean, I, I just thought, okay, I hadn't looked at it. I had looked at everything else you could think of, entertained it, and, and uh, at least looked at it. Never, nobody wants to look at the flat earth. That's how bad it is, you know, which is why in the documentary, you know, it's the DVD you get for Christmas that's just stupid. You know, everybody's got it. Everybody gets a book or a DVD or something. It's like, I am never going to read this. Do you throw it off somewhere and hope to God it doesn't come back? That's how I got into it. Um, convincing people. Okay, I'll give you my top, top five bullet points, which weren't in the documentary, because I don't even think they even existed when we, when we did the documentary, uh, which are these. And I'll, give you, I'll, I'll, I'll frame it for you. There was a German television team that hooked me up with a, a debate with a Georgetown University professor, astrophysicist, actually. And they said, okay, come up with five science questions. We'll record you saying these quick questions, and we'll send the video to him, and we'll just do this back and forth because scientists are not really good in they're, they're not good. I mean they're good at their field but they're not really good on camera and they're not very good in debates they're very monosyllable type guys so they're like this uh, five five top points which are first one long distance photography which I, I went over earlier uh, you can see distant uh, things in the distance way way too far way too far. The curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared. Why can we something, see something at 50 miles or 70 miles or, or farther? Should not be able to see it. And you want to say it's refraction, that's fine. But we can say, we can show you things that just destroy mirages, destroy illusions. I mean, again, the video from um, uh, Santa Barbara, which I just put up this week, a great example of that. Uh, second one would be gravity versus the vacuum of space. Love this one. 
So everybody knows you blow up a balloon, you know, with your mouth and you let it go. hundred times out of a hundred, what happens? The balloon just flies off, right? Why? Because the pressure in the balloon was greater than the pressure outside of the balloon. Um, you can say the same thing when you blow up a basketball or football or a volleyball, or all that stuff. Why did that? Why, why are they tight? Why can't you burst a basketball? Well, you know, it's because it's really, really tight. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of air in there, but it's, it's also really, really strong. And the, here's where it gets interesting. Vacuum. Uh, there's a law of physics that says that pressure cannot exist next to non-pressure. Meaning, again, you let go of the balloon, why? It's always going to let go. So if you put a vacuum chamber, and you can look these up all day long. If you put a vacuum chamber in the second floor, I don't know if there's a second floor of your building or not, and you put a cork in the ceiling and you pop it, what happens? It's not like the movies. It's instant. In fact, you can look this up on YouTube. It's a f there's fantastic videos on it. Um, well, anything in a vacuum chamber, obviously. But there's something the Germans do, I don't know why, where they take steel rail cars steel not aluminum and they put a vacuum field on the inside of them and instantly in a fraction of a second they just get crushed like they were eaten by godzilla amazingly fast so it's not like the movies where if you get a hole in your spaceship it's like oh my god we only have two minutes of air left get the duct tape no it's it's over in a, in in the tenth of a second it's it's that fast i mean the whole thing just explodes uh and and you're dead it's it's not like the movies so the question is is if there's a vacuum chamber above you and you pop the cork, what happens? The air equalizes instantly, all day long. No physicist is ever going to deny that. So the question is, why didn't gravity keep the air in your room? Why did it go upstairs? And you're saying, well, because vacuum is stronger than uh, gravity. It's like, yes, absolutely, all day long, every day. Gravity cannot beat a vacuum. You do this every time you take a straw and you suck a soda out of a glass. Why didn't gravity keep the soda in that glass? Well, because you sucked it out with the straw. And that was just you doing that. That's not very hard. So the question is, when you walk outside, how, how are you breathing right now? Why is the air still here? Because remember, all around us supposedly is this massive vacuum of space. Why didn't the atmosphere just get ripped off? Why are you still breathing when you go outside? And if you come back and say gravity, I go, oh, no, 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 no. Because remember, gravity couldn't even keep the air in your room. Same gravity, the exact same gravity as what's outside. No scientist can explain this. And, and, and the follow-up question is, where does our atmosphere end and space begin? Where is the bleeding edge of space? No one can ever answer it. Third question, uh, the eclipse shadow. Uh, were you guys around uh, during that eclipse for like in 2017? Everyone close to that? So there was a big eclipse yeah. shadow across the United States, right? The eclipse shadow is small, 70 miles wide. Why? Exactly. Uh, the moon is 2,000 miles wide, if that's what mainstream science says. So why is the eclipse shadow 20 miles wide? And it's the equivalent of you walking by a building and your shadow shrinking down to the size of an action figure. Or smaller, actually. So why does it do that? Now, science will come back and say, well, it's convexing. It's, it's creating this lens effect and it's creating this tiny little dot based on this huge object. I go, okay, that's fine. So why don't we see that when the, the, the Earth is in front of the sun? We see a blood moon, but the Earth is 8,000 miles wide. Why don't we see this giant 250-mile-wide shadow across the moon? Why doesn't the moon look like an eyeball? Never, ever happens. Nobody can explain it. And it, by the way, that fits into our model because we say that the, the sun or the moon is only about, especially in this case, the moon, the moon is less than 50 miles wide. So having a blackout zone of 70 miles, that works perfectly for us. Fourth one is the moon temperature. I didn't even believe this. I was into flat earth for a year when we, when we were shown this and I didn't even think it was real, but it's absolutely true. And you can test this out yourself with $20 point and click thermometer which is somebody said, oh yeah, the, by the way, the moonlight is cold. And I go, I mean, it's colder at night. Everybody knows it's colder at night. And it's like, no, 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 the moon actually cools things down by quite a bit. It's like, really? So if you are in the sun, so it's 80 degrees in the sun and it's 70 degrees in the shade. We all know whatever you're standing in front of blocks the sun's rays. But if you're in the moonlight, let's say it's 50 degrees in the moonlight it's 60 degrees in the moonshade it's always warmer in the moonshade in fact up to 13 degrees warmer 
And you can test this out again with an engine, you know, point and click thermometer, 20 bucks, hardware store or copper strips or whatever. And in fact, you can, I can take it one step further and I can say, take a magnifying glass to moonlight, right? So if you take a magnifying glass to sunlight, you know, you can burn things, you know, paper, ants, your friends. So if you take uh, a magnifying glass to moonlight, what happens? It actually gets even colder than normal moonlight. And we can do this now. That's this technology that we have now. It's called a cool laser. You can change the frequency of a laser beam and make it cooler. Now, not you can't make ice cubes necessarily, as far as I know, but you can actually make things colder. So why is the moon generating a cold light? Does this prove a flat earth? Nope. But does it create, it just destroys the relationship between the sun and the moon because the moon supposedly reflecting the sun's light. Nope. As far as we can tell, the moon is just its own entity. It's just a nightlight flying around up there. Last but not least, fifth point, which is the Van Allen radiation belts. Van Allen radiation belts uh, announced by NASA in the 1950s. Big belt of radiation, suppose, around our globe. Super, super deadly. No one should ever go up there. People die if you go up there and you go through it. Are they deadly? Yes or no? It's a simple question. And if you say yes, then I say, okay, how the Americans get through it so many times? You know, the Americans went round trips through this thing, super, super deadly with no shielding. The only things that stop radiation are gold, lead, and a whole bunch of water. So how the Americans go to the moon and back with aluminum and plastic shielding and nobody died, nobody got radiation poisoning, nobody even got cancer. There's still five of these guys walking around right now. How'd they do it? No one has an answer to that. Uh, and if you say, well, okay, well, they're not deadly. I go, oh, okay. Then go to the, um, the NASA.gov website. There's a wonderful video there called Orion Trial by Fire, which they state in great detail on video that they can't test capsules going up to space because they haven't solved the radiation problem. And I say, okay, uh, you mean the radiation problem you perfectly solved in the 60s and 70s nobody ever had a problem with it ever ever you can't solve it now it's 2020 so i anyway those five questions were sent off to the astrophysicist and he folded that was it he said nope we're not doing this shut it all down the germans went home and uh, the segment never aired i mean i've got the recording of the initial interview with the germans but it was staggering so between those five questions uh that's usually what gets people going enough to where now will you be convinced by that no but i put a seed in people's heads with those questions and usually from there it takes them a couple weeks yeah, wow all right so so mark we're going to kind of let you move move on with your life here and and i think you've given us some uh some great stuff to to think about these those five points at the end that's really cool because we you know the the movie didn't didn't really oh show yeah them. no and, and they and they weren't going to either i mean i i i feel bad. I mean, people ask me, let me, let me throw one more thing in at you, which is people say, would you change anything about the movie? Um, not really. I mean, I got to go to film festivals in different parts of the country and watch audiences and audiences liked the, the back and forth. They liked listening to uh, both sides of the issue. And that's what, that's what brought them in. And um, they didn't want to make it a propaganda piece. And so I don't blame them. The, and the, only, the only thing I think it would have changed was Jaron's thing at the end. But that was just the way it was shot. And part of it was Jaron's fault. But whatever. You, you take the good with the bad. Certainly. Certainly. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we're going yeah. to have the class. We're going to delve into these five points and, uh, <laughs> and take a little deeper dive into them. And if we have any more questions for you, uh, we'll, we'll certainly be in touch and, and, and send those your way and see if you can. Oh, yeah, yeah. Happy to do it. But, but you, you didn't get a chance to record the audio on this, did you? Uh, I believe so. Did you, if, if I, I would love to have it if you ever, if you, yes, when you yes. have the time. I can absolutely send that to you. Uh, okay. Your address is on the uh, YouTube channel, correct? Yeah, yeah. Or, or again, it's not going to be very big. You could always just drop it into Skype. Uh, it'll, Skype sure. will take up to, I think, 250 megs. Without okay. Problem. We were going to, well, okay. we were going to, uh, we wanted to send you a little care package for, uh, for taking Aww. the time for this there. So uh, <laughs> the, the, your, your mailing address is in there, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's in, it's in the okay. description box of, of every video I make, uh, including gotcha. my phone number and, and everything else. Gotcha. Well, we'll we'll uh, we'll have something coming your way very soon, there. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, guys, and and thanks for putting up with me and and watching the documentary and all that other stuff. Oh, and uh, oh, ha happy you guys listened. Oh, 
All right, guys, we want to wave bye Thanks, tomorrow. Man. Bye, Thanks, bye guys. Bye. See ya. Stay flat. <laughs> <laughs> uh.